The concept of infinity has always been confusing. In ancient Greece, it was completely taboo, and mathematicians in the Dark Ages simply ignored it. Answer Georg Cantor in the late 19th century. He took infinity out from under the rug and he looked at it hard. He not only found a way to properly define the concept, but he also found that there were many more infinities, in fact a whole order of infinities, one larger than the next, going on forever. In this video, I'm going to give you a taste of Georg Cantor's world. Let's start with some basic definitions. Um, Cantor's work is inherently set in set theory, so you need to know a little bit about that before before moving on. A set is simply a collection of distinct objects. Note that sets are considered an object in their own right. An element is an object in a set. So here's an example of a set in the way you would notate it. The set is called S, and it contains the elements 1, 2, and 3. You write them separated by commas in a bracket. S equals its set. Um, note that the order does not matter. I could have written 2, 1, 3, and it would have been the exact same set. Also, note that the collection of objects have to be distinct. So in this case, for example, 2 could not be included twice in the set. It would be redundant. Here's another example of a set. Um, it's got negative 12, pi, a little stick figure, and the set S. Um, since sets are considered an object in their own right, they can be an element of another set. Here's a set of integers. You could write it out like this in set notation, but it's easier to just assign it, and the assigned value, or the assigned variable is this z-looking thing. z is the set of integers, and r is the set of all real numbers. This is how you would write so so and so is an element of such a set. Two is an element of the set of integers. That's the symbol. Okay, great. So what can you do with sets? Well, there's a couple of things. First, you might want to know the cardinality of a set. This is just the number of elements in the set. Um, here's an example. Find the cardinality of set S. Well, clearly it's three. There's just three elements. And this is how you would write it. Cardinality of S equals 3. You might also want to compare sets. Um, two sets are considered equal if you can form a bijection between them. That sounds fancy, but it's really simple. Here are two sets. As you noticed, I have mapped one element of one set to an element of the other. If every single element can be paired up with no leftover, in either set, then this is said to be a bijection, and the sets are equal. It's really just common sense. Uh, you could also say sets are equal if you know their cardinality, and their cardinality is equal. One more concept, the power set. The power set is the set of all subsets of a particular set. Let me just show you an example. Here's our set, S equals, and the set contains the elements 1, 2, and 3. So the power set of S would have to be a set containing every single subset possible with S, including the empty set and S itself. So there would be the empty set, and just nothing. Then you could have, say, just one element, just one. Then just two, just three. Um, a subset could contain two elements, one and two, one and three, two and three. Or you could have a subset, which is a whole set. So this is the power set of S. Um, there's something interesting about it. Look, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight elements. The cardinality of the power set of S is equal to 2 to the power of the cardinality of the set S itself. Is this a coincidence? Well, no, it's due to the way each of these can be constructed. Every time you're trying to find a subset, you can ask, should 1 be included in the subset? Yes or no? 2? Yes or no? 3? Yes or no? So for every single 
bracket, there's two options for each element, so two to the third options, two to the third total brackets. Um, if that doesn't make sense, it doesn't really matter, it's not relevant to the video, just a little tidbit. Now let's get into the meat of the video, infinity. I'm going to start with the lowest order of infinity, countable infinity. It, the symbol for it is Aleph Naught, something like that. Countable infinity is defined as the cardinality of the set counting numbers. That's it, very simple, countable infinity. And the reason it's called countable infinity is because these are just counting numbers. You count one, two, three, four, five, six, and if you keep going on forever, the cardinality of that is Aleph naught. Okay, that's interesting. Um, what if, okay, let's consider a subset of this set subset of alpha not consisting of only even numbers well surely you say this is a lesser infinity it doesn't include all the odd numbers well is it mm, well remember you can do a bijection mapping so let's try that you map 1 to 2 2 to 4 3 to 6 4 to 8 five. you can do that forever so what that means is the positive numbers are also a countable infinity and the two are equal despite being a subset of each other. It's very confusing. The same goes with all of the integers, positive and negative. You list those out, you start on one end, negative five, negative four, negative three, negative two, negative one, zero. Then you go to the positive end, and you might say, surely since it goes to infinity and other side, this is greater than countable infinity. Well, actually it's not. If you took the list of counting numbers, which define countable infinity, you could map the first one to zero, the second one to 1, the third one to negative 1, the fourth one to 2, the fifth one to negative 2, and so on. As you can see, a superset of countable infinity is also countable infinity. It's very strange. Infinity plus 1 is still infinity. Infinity minus 1 is still infinity, still aleph naught. So you might be wondering, well, maybe Aleph naught is all there is. Um, if Aleph naught is defined as the cardinality of counting numbers, and it's equal to the integers, the or even numbers, odd numbers, maybe you you could think that countable infinity is all there is. Well, that's actually not the case. As it turns out, no matter how hard Gero Cantor tried, he could not map the real numbers to the counting numbers, which led him to a, trying to find a proof to prove that the real numbers have an infinity greater than that of the counting numbers, and indeed they do. First, a quick definition. Real numbers are all the numbers on the number line. Real numbers cannot be mapped to the counting numbers with the bijection. Real numbers, the cardinality of the set of real numbers, is actually called Aleph 1. It's greater than the cardinality of the counting numbers, which is Aleph 0. And here's a proof. It's a proof by contradiction. First, let's assume that the counting num uh, that the real numbers can indeed be counted. So we're going to place them in a list. Just going to just going to consider the positive ones. If there's a contradiction with the positive ones, then there's no way the negative ones will even be able to do a one-to-one -one mapping. 
So you place them in the list in order from smallest to greatest. And then uh, each number is represented like this symbolically. Um, the first number corresponds with the place value of that number in the list. Second with the um, decimal position. So this is the decimal for the first number, first position, decimal, first number, second position, decimal, first number, third position, and so on. Okay? So you've written down every single number. The list, of course, is infinite, but that's fine. You can still map infinitely. You're mapping to the counting numbers, which themselves are infinite. Let's take a diagonal mapping. So we'll consider this, this, this. Take the numbers diagonally. Now we'll create a new number, let's call it n, in which each decimal gets added one value. So this decimal, you add one to it. This decimal, you add one to it. The next decimal, you add one to it, and you form a number like that. Now this new number is different than every single number. It's different from the first number because we added one to that digit's value. It's different from the second number for the same reason, third, fourth. This number is not on the list. And yet, it should be, because it's just a real number made of decimals. This is a contradiction, which means that the real numbers cannot be mapped to the counting numbers. This led Georg Cantor to call them Aleph 1, the next order of infinity. Okay, so, so far I've shown you two different orders of infinity. Countable infinity... Aleph null, which is defined as the cardinality of a set of counting numbers. Odd numbers are countable infinity. Even numbers are countable infinity. Integers are countable infinity. Rational numbers are countable infinity. However, real numbers are not countable infinity. Real numbers are part of the continuum. Aleph 1, defined as the cardinality of the real numbers. Now, this is all interesting, but you may be wondering, what is the relationship in size between these two infinities, and are there other infinities? Well, this is a great unsolved problem. There actually is an answer, but no hard and fast proof to it. If set theory is internally consistent, then it's right, and if it's not, then it's not right, but there's no way to prove it. And it's all very advanced. I'm not going to get into it. I hardly understand it myself, to be honest. Okay, so here is the relationship. Remember the power set? That's where it comes in. The power set, the cardinality of the power set of S is equal to 2 to the power of the cardinality of S. This formula applies to the infinities. Aleph 1 continuum, the set of real, is equal to aleph naught, 2 to the power of aleph naught. The next infinity, aleph sub 2, is equal to 2 to the power aleph sub 1, and so on. But all of this, of course, is just generalization. There's no actual sets other than sets of infinities. So basically all this stuff is just useless extrapolation. But there you have it. Uh, the continuum, continuum hypothesis should look into it. Countable infinity, infinity of the reals, and infinity beyond.